So we are in part two of our message series called Deep and Wide, and I believe that it's time for us to go deeper and wider as a church. If you were here last week, you might remember the analogy of a tree that grows deep roots and reaches all those rich nutrients and all that, the water that's, that's deep in the earth. And so as Psalm 1 says, it's a tree that's planted along a riverbank and bears fruit in every season because its source of life is, is not from the weather and the climate around it. Its source is from the deep, rich soil and the water uh, beneath it. This tree also digs deep roots so it can grow bigger and grow stronger and bear more branches and more fruit, ultimately. So today we're going to talk about that fruit and what it means to grow not just deeper, but to grow wider. So here's the main idea for today. I'll just kind of give you the bottom line right out of the gate. It's just simply this idea that we need to widen our view, that we need to widen our view. For us as a church, it means reaching far out to those who are not a part of the community of faith in Christ. It also means bearing spiritual fruit in our families, in our church, and in our community as well. You know, we've seen a lot of good things happen over these last few years, but we can't stop now. We can't get complacent because I believe that really God is just now getting started with a new work. And so we can't get too comfortable because you know what happens when you, when you start getting comfortable and complacent, the enemy starts to come in and infect us with some of his famous poisons. Do you know about some of the enemy's poisons that he gives? Things like being religious, which basically means spiritualizing things that are not spiritual. Another poison is he He poisons us with self-centeredness that that we turn inward and we mainly serve ourselves. He poisons us with gossip that we end up talking more about each other than we talk about how to reach people with the gospel. It's one of his poisons. Or, Or another one is becoming divided. He poisons us with division that exclusive separate groups start happening and and they become closed off to others. And many churches have fallen victim to these tactics of the enemy. And we don't want to be one of those. We want to be the kind of church that just continues to be passionate about what God has called us to do. Don't we want to be that kind of church? That we want to be a, a bright light here on this mountain. So, instead of being religious, let's be authentic. Instead of being self-centered, why don't we be self sacrificing. Instead of gossiping, let's talk about how to reach and to help hurting people. Instead of becoming divided because of fear or because of assumptions about each, each other, let's learn to leverage our differences to do kingdom work. Let's realize that we're all a different part of the body, and so we're going to be different. And that's not a bad thing. That is something we can actually leverage. So we know that God has done a lot, but we've got to go wider. But don't be overwhelmed because there's actually not that much to it. It's kind of a simple idea because, you know, sometimes we make church really complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. Church is pretty simple. The, The church mainly exists for two reasons, just to know God and to make him known. The church mainly exists for two reasons, to know God and to make Him known, or you could say to be in relationship with God and to help others be in relationship with Him, or to love God and to help others love God. Now, I know in in some ways it's an oversimplification of, of what we do because there's so much packed into these ideas, but at a basic heart level, this is what we're here for to know God and to make Him known. Now notice that there's two parts to it. And as we talked about last week, we're called to know God, to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. And those are major important parts of our faith and why we gather as a church. But Christ also sent us into the world to spread His message of His love by our words and by our deeds, by our actions. 
to spread that message to those who are far from God. And it's what we call the Great Commission. Many of you might be familiar with it. It's what Jesus told his followers right before he left this earth, after his resurrection, uh, before he ascended back to the Father. He told us, go and make disciples of all the nations in Matthew 28, 19. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And thank the Lord that he is with us, that we don't have to do all this on our own. So what is the first word in this verse, in these verses? The first word, what is it? What is it? Go. Uh, Go. Unfortunately, going is harder than staying, isn't it? Going is harder than staying because, I mean, maybe I'm the only one, but I like my comfort zone. Does anybody else like, you kind of like things as you know them? You like your comfort zone. We like our routines. We like things to be predictable, don't we? Oh, you're being quiet now. What happened? Just me. Okay. Well, I'm weird, I guess. Like to know what's coming. Like to know how something's going to be. So I don't know what going looks like for you or what would be out of your comfort zone. For some of us, it might mean things like going to China to teach English and to to share the gospel in, in your actions. And when you can, when you're able to share the word, you can. You, you do. Maybe that's what it means. Or maybe it means going and starting a church in Zambia, Africa and combating poverty and disease. Maybe. And maybe there's somebody right here among us who that is what going would look like for you because that would be out of your comfort zone. Probably most of us would fit that. But maybe it's, it's being a school teacher. Maybe it's It's loving on some kids whose families are broken and who are hurting, and it's raising these kids up to make a difference, to to be a positive influence and a role model in their community. Or maybe it's being intentional with showing the love of Christ to our neighbors and looking for opportunities to encourage them and tell them about what Jesus has done for us, sharing our story about the power of God in our lives. Maybe it's just simply praying regularly for those people in our lives who don't know Jesus. Or it's interceding in prayer for other believers who are out there on the front lines that are fighting the battles every day as they do the work of ministry. I think about our churches. We have some Church of Gods there in in Ukraine. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week as we'll have an opportunity to support the work that's going on in Ukraine to help people. We'll have a way to donate and all that. But there's There's people on the front lines right now. Our church of God's over there. Churches of God are are transporting people across the border. They're trying to get people out. And they're risking their lives doing that. That could be going. That could be out of the comfort zone. But it could just be interceding for those. Interceding means standing in the gap between God and a person. It means going to God on their behalf, praying protection and provision and breakthrough and deliverance and miracles, the prayer of intercession. That could be stepping out of your comfort zone. Because see, the truth is that going in this great commission, it looks different for each one of us. But we as the body of Christ are all called to go make disciples in some way. Let me say, say that again, that we're all called to go make disciples. Jesus didn't just say this to, his, to, to certain personality types or even certain giftings, or he didn't just say it to them and say, now that's only for you guys that are here with me today, not, not the future of the church. No, he was commissioning his whole church, all of us. And we all do it together. We don't all do the exact same thing. Some people are on the front lines, some people are out front, some people are on stage, some people are behind the scenes, some people you'll never see them and know their name, but they're, they're in the engine room making the Great Commission go forward. We all do it in different ways. 
So what are we talking about? We're not just talking about going and doing something. We're starting with a mindset because it's really a mindset shift that, that's going to require discipline and intentionality. Because focusing outward, if we're honest, is not really our natural tendency. Right? I mean, think about it. We're not naturally just focused outward. Let me look out and see who may need. Who do I need to pray for? And what's going on you know, today out there in people's lives? Or you know, even sometimes we come to church. We don't wake up Sunday morning and say, God, is there somebody there at church today that I can bless, that I can pray over, that I can connect with, that I can encourage? Can I pour out into someone else today? Pour out your love and your spirit. We don't always naturally think that way. Not saying that that's impossible to do, but we have to train ourselves. We have to be disciplined and intentional to think that way. It's a mindset shift, and that's where it's got to start. Not just go out and do a bunch of stuff so you don't feel guilty. It starts in a mindset shift. But it's our mission as the church to grow wider, to reach new people. Because see, what we do around here in this thing called church is we make disciples. Disciples is a church word for followers or students or people that are raised up in the faith. We make disciples who then go and make disciples. You're getting it. And then those disciples grow up and then they go make... Okay, we're at about 50%. And then those people grow up and make... Disciples, there we go, and see how it continues? And that's how it started in the early church. The apostles, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. The church began. The apostle Paul got out and did all his missionary journeys, planting churches, and they were raising up disciples who made disciples who made disciples. Fast forward, us today. Making disciples who make disciples. That's how it works. That's our mission. And so the, the million-dollar question is, if the church, if we never reach new people, how do we do that? How do, how do we make disciples who make disciples who make disciples if we never reach new people? It's a hard question. And that's partly, I believe, why some of our churches and our, and our culture and our country are suffering and dying because the focus has shifted and turned inward and new people are not on the radar. But then there's the question that many of us who've been around church a little while ask when we start talking about this and start talking about reaching new people and that's why we're here and we start going that direction. The question then becomes, but what about us? What about us? What about our needs? What about my needs? Now, I think in, in some ways this is a fair question because if we all of a sudden just abandon our love and care for one another, we've really lost what it means to be a church. We've, we've lost the whole, at least part of the idea. We always have to care for our body, for our own church body, for fellow believers. Of course we do, but... If we take an honest look at ourselves, that's usually not where we struggle, right? We, we don't usually have a hard time with this. We, we don't have a hard time focusing on ourselves in the church and what we like and what we want. And focusing on one another, at least our, not our, our close group of friends and our family. But what happens, and it's happened time and time again in churches, is that over time... Since we're human, we naturally start to cater to ourselves and we start to become inward and then we become insulated. And so it, it, it just becomes harder and harder as, as you get older even or just throughout life. It, be, it becomes harder to start new relationships or to constantly be inviting new people into our lives. It's just harder. So we like to get, get things set a certain way. The way we like it, we arrange life, and then we hit cruise control. Just let it drive. Same people, same seats, same routine, same expectations, and we just coast to the point 
That if a new person came to church and even if they sat on our row, we wouldn't even see them. And that's not an exaggeration. That's actually happened many times, just even in my own experience. I've seen it. So we have to work hard against this tendency. But it doesn't mean that, that we abandon believers so that we can reach out to outsiders or new believers. It doesn't mean we totally abandon one another. It just means that we have to widen our view. We have to widen our view. It makes a lot of sense if you think about how a family is supposed to be. Let me talk to the parents for a minute. If you've been a parent or you are one, parents, we sacrifice our desires, right? We sacrifice our preferences. Sometimes we sacrifice our goals for the sake of our kids, right? We do that. We give up things. And so if I, if I sit down to watch TV or watch a movie or just we're going to turn on something as a family and we have the choice between that annoying, I mean, new Disney movie called Encanto. Oh, Bruno, what is the deal? I can't even go there. Gets stuck in my head. I know some of you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. You are blessed for it, okay? <laughs> so if that is an option, or if like, let's say a Steelers game is an option, guess what we're watching? We're watching Encanto, and I'm going to the other room on my computer and watching. No, I'm going to stick with them, and we'll watch the movie. I know there's ways around it because we have other TVs and things. But if we, if we just had to all be together, who's going to win out? It's going to be my kids. Or if there's one slice of pizza left, which is a tragedy, by the way. Never order exactly what you need. You need more. It's good the next day. But if there's only one piece of pizza left and everyone's still hungry, guess who's not eating it? This guy. Not eating it. It's probably going to go to one of my kids who's still hungry so that they can eat. Do you see it? See it? In the same way, mature believers make sacrifices for the needs of new believers or for the, the, the needs of non-believers even. Mature believers make sacrifices for the needs of new or non-believers. Now, there's one more piece to this about this analogy, thinking about family. In our family dynamic, and if there's one piece of pizza and the kids get it, however, I'm still, I'm married, and I have a commitment to my wife that goes beyond our children. And so here's how it all fits together. I have to cultivate my marriage so that I can properly care for my children and so that my children can see what good parents look like and what good spouses look like. So that they can see this is how a husband is supposed to treat his wife. This is how a wife's supposed to treat her husband. So it's not just give all up and give all for the kids. And no, my, my wife and I, we have a relationship that's separate from them. And that's important because they're watching. So it's not all about them all the time. But when it comes down to it, we make sacrifices for our kids. Does that make sense how that connects here? The family unit is a great, a great way to view the church and what we're talking about. Because, you know, the hope is that my kids, think about the church, right? So my kids are going to grow up and we want them to be spouses and parents, right? So as I'm raising them, I'm raising them with the idea that they are going to do this one day. So it's not all about, let me just raise my kid and keep them safe and keep them pulled in and, and, and keep them sheltered and just keep them from all the bad stuff. No, I'm not trying to just keep my kid from the bad stuff. I'm trying to sharpen them and train them and raise them because one day they're going to do what I'm doing and the world's going to be pretty different than my world. I think it's going to be harder. 
they're going to need some serious tools. So in the church, what do we do? That. We, get, we have new people. And we raise disciples with the idea, the end in mind, that they are one day going to raise disciples. So we give them practice. We give them time to develop. We do things like, oh, I don't know, have kids come up and sing a special on stage. Because we're raising them up. Not just to be nice people, but to be weapons of the kingdom. Do we get that? We're doing the same thing in church. We're raising weapons of the kingdom. It's like scripture talks about kids being, being like an arrow that you shoot. Like an arrow you pull out of the quiver and you fire it into the world. A sharpened, targeted arrow. In our families, yes. But in the church too. Spiritual kids are a thing. Not just in our families. So are we raising them up with this in mind? Do we actually believe this as believers? Do we believe this about the church? Is the idea of raising up people who then go raise up people, is that at the forefront of our minds when we do church? Is it at the forefront of our mind? Is it one of the first things we think of? I think that's a challenging question. And speaking of children... Many of you know that there is a shift that happens when a couple has children. That's the understatement of 2022 right there. There is a shift that happens when a couple has children, and a lot of it involves dying to self. Praise the Lord for that, right? Dying to self. So if you think, if you don't have kids yet, and you think you're not selfish, the Lord bless you. Just go have children. Just have kids. You'll see. You're a terrible person. You, you'll just find out. Because you're hiding in the laundry room eating Lucky Charms because you don't want your kids to see. I didn't do that, though. So just a random and nonspecific example, okay? <laughs> because in parenting... If there's a situation where you have to choose between serving yourself and serving your child, you choose your child. In church, if there has to be a choice between serving ourselves and serving the unchurched, our potential children, we have to choose to prioritize the unchurched if we're going to fulfill the Great Commission. It doesn't, it doesn't work if we don't do that. If we just circle the wagons and turn and face one another, it doesn't work. And it doesn't fulfill Jesus' commandment to us. So let me put it plainly in a simple statement. That our focus must be outward more than inward. Our focus must be outward more than it is inward. I'm not saying it has to be completely outward. But, but there has to be more so of a focus going outward. And this has to be communicated clearly in practical ways. So if it's a choice, just practically speaking, in church where we, we can choose between giving more member perks or we could choose to invest more in our kids and in their parents in our schools, what are we going to choose? We're going to invest in the kids and in their families. If it's either singing the familiar songs that us church people know and that we like, if it's that or singing the new songs that new believers can connect with, in this day and age, I'm giving way to them. Because we're raising up a new generation of Christ followers. And I just believe that the Holy Spirit is going to raise up new and artistic and creative expressions of worship. As I'm right in the middle, as I'm 40 years old, I was the beneficiary of a lot of the stuff I'm talking about. A lot of stuff was done for me and for my generation, and a lot was poured in. And I've made the shift, especially since having kids, but now starting to look at, okay, I know the way that I've done church, I know the way I've been raised and all this stuff, but, but what, is, what new is being born? What new expressions? We don't have to do it the way we've always done it. 
What's being birthed in this generation? What do they connect to? What makes sense to them? How do they relate to the Lord? The truth is, really, that those of us like me that have been in church for a long time, I mean, for me, it's been my whole life, we should be able to handle not getting our way all the time, right? We, should, we, should, we can handle that. We're the mature ones. We know that the point of coming to church isn't just to get what we want, right? Point of church, if we've been around church a long time, we know the point isn't just to come get fed, right? I'm a 40-year-old man. My parent doesn't feed me anymore. I feed myself. We know that in church, I hope. <laughs> What is the point then? Why, why do we come? What, if I've been around church for a long time, you mean I don't come to get fed? No. Is that okay? Because you feed yourself. There are six other days in the week. We come to pour life into a new generation that has yet to experience God like we have. That's why I do what I do, honestly. Pour it out. Pour it out. You know, we have so many kids back there and teens that are just starting to get sharpened. And one day they're going to be in here with us. And I'm, I'm envisioning a day when you're going to see these kids leading. Leading. Not when they're 40. When they're 22. Leading. What? You're telling me a 22-year-old could lead? Yes, they absolutely can. An 18-year-old can lead. I've seen it. But I'm not just talking about age. A new generation is not an age bracket. You could be 50 years old, and if you come to Christ, you're a new believer. You're, part, you're one of our kids. You could be 40 like me, and you could be one of our kids. Because you're just now coming into the faith, not just believing in God, but practicing. You're, you're just now starting to practice your faith. So we, we will do anything short of sin to see this happen. We'll do anything to raise these guys up. Because more than anything, this generation needs an encounter with God. That's, that's, that's what is the key. We can, we can teach them. We can teach them how to be good and moral. We can, we can have them memorize scripture verses and go to talent shows and go to youth conferences. And we can make sure that they don't hang around the wrong people. We could do all these good things. But at the end of the day, let me just tell you what's going to matter when they go to college. It's not going to be that they went to a class on Sunday morning. It's going to be that they had an encounter with the living God. And they won't shake him no matter how far they go. I moved from California to Tennessee to, do, to go to college. And I couldn't shake the spirit of God. My parents did not check on me. They couldn't. Back in the days before cell phones. Couldn't really just keep tabs on. Is he going to church? Is he going to church? No. I had to decide for myself. Am I going to church? Am I going to be involved? Am I going to be a part of something? They need an encounter with God. So we have to widen our view. Because sometimes we get so caught up in our own worlds that we just forget about the world around us. That we forget that there are people around us who would love to be in our shoes. Who look at our lives way differently than we look at our lives. Have you ever complained about something and then later felt really convicted about how trivial it was? How trivial, trivial it was? That you complained and you realize, man, what am I complaining about? Or you, you see the news and what's going on in Ukraine and you think, I will never complain again. But we live in a first world country that's safe and that's prosperous. So we have first world problems. You ever heard of those? First world problems like the TV remote is on the other side of the room. <sighs> I got to get up. Things like the garage is just too full of all the stuff I don't use. That's a first world problem. Or the classic first world problem, this Wi-Fi is so slow. Or groceries have gotten so expensive, we might just have to stop eating out a lot. <sighs> Suffering. Or the first world problem of there's just no good parking spots. 
Well, there are. They're just in the back. I'm not parking in the back. First world problem. Or the, the problem of I can't decide where to eat. There's just too many options. Stressful. Or how about gas is so expensive now. I'm going to have to drive my other car that gets better gas mileage. Man, just really hurting. Or one more. Man, I got to go buy new clothes again. I got to buy a whole new wardrobe because I've picked up a few pounds and everything's tight. I'm just going to have to go buy all new clothes. Man, two first world problems in there, if you caught that. So we have to stop sometimes and think about our view. We have to think about how do we widen our view? Do we know about the area in which we live? Let's talk about that for a minute. Let me show you a map. Go ahead and show them. There we go. So I kind of drew out our area. The pin, the pin there, the red pin, is our church. And kind of sort of off of memory, drew a box of where our church people come from. So we've got people all the way up to Somerset, over to Uniontown, down to Friendsville, Brewston Mills. This is sort of like the region in which our church uh, reaches. Now, it, it kind of makes sense that it would be this area because we are uh, we're Maryland and West Virginia and Somerset County, and we're in Fayette County. It's all less than five miles in different directions from where we're at right now. So if you're online and you're not from here, we're right in the corner of our state or of our county, um, right, right where all these, these places converge. We're just tucked in this corner. So what are some of the characteristics of our area? Well, I did a little bit of research, and it was challenging, but I uh, went to censusreporter.org and uh, did the demographics, at least some of them, for Fayette County, Somerset County, Preston County, West Virginia, and Garrett County, Maryland. And so I combined all of those numbers and averaged them out, and this is what we have in our area in these four uh, four counties. Population of 265,854 265, people, where a median income is 50,922, and then the national average for that in the United States is 62,000 roughly. Uh, the median age in this four county area is 45, which is compared to the national average of 38, a little bit younger. Uh, under 18 years old, we have 19% of the people in these four counties are under 18 years old, compared to a 16% national average. So this may surprise some people that we have more young people, more under 18 than the national average. And just so you know, by the way, this isn't related to these stats, but in our church stats, uh, the percentage of people in our church uh, that are regular attenders um, that are under 18 years old is 35%. 35% of our church is under 18. 68 out of 192 are under 18. 68 people. Over 65 years old, we have 22%. National average, 23%. A little bit less. And then <clears throat> next page is 94%. Uh, let's see. I'll make sure I'm following what you're following. Commute to work, 27 minutes, right on the national average. Ethnicity is 94% white, as opposed to 60% nationally. Houses with a married couple is 63%. 60% is the national average. Bachelor's degree or higher is at 18%, as opposed to a national average of 32%. And then living below the poverty line is 14%, the national average of 13%. Also, one thing that's not on there is that our area is split right down the middle at 50% male and 50% female, and the national average is 51% female. So about the same. So it just seems to me when I start looking at these things, just a few things that come out is that we're a hardworking, blue-collar area that values families, 
values our children over a lot of other things. So what can we do to reach the people around us with the message of Jesus and His love for them? What can we do to reach some of these 265,000 people? Well, the first thing is we just have to simply widen our view to see them, just to see people and to care about reaching them. And one of my favorite passages, really, that really gives us insight into how to do this and what Paul did is, is from Paul when he wrote to the church in 1 Corinthians 9. He said, even though I'm a free man with no master, I've become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ, a slave or, or a servant. So verse 20, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. Then he sort of simplifies it for us. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Paul had a way of connecting with all kinds of different people because he saw them and he cared about them. So are we finding ways to relate to people, uh, to, to find common ground with them so we can reach them? What about the people who are different than you? Remember, different doesn't equal bad. There's, a, there's kind of an undercurrent sometimes in some people's minds that, that if something is different, it's bad. Or, oh, that's different, you know, that saying. But it doesn't naturally just mean that. Different doesn't equal bad. Jesus was able to reach across all kinds of socioeconomic divides like race and gender and income and age. He reached across all of them. And his followers who are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're called to connect with the people that God has put in our path. So who has God put in your path? Apostle Paul, he knew that the mission of Christ meant that he'd be around different types of people in different types of environments. So he didn't expect everyone to become like him so that he might share Christ with them. He related to them. He tried to understand their perspective before he shared the gospel with them. He didn't didn't make his faith all about him. Instead, he made it about them, and he found ways to relate to people in different ways while still being genuine and true to who he was and who God made him to be. It wasn't like he was being fake or manipulative, still being genuine. So I want to end today by telling you about someone who's another ultimate example of what it means to widen your view, and her name was Margaret Gaines, and you'll see her picture on the screen, and She was born in 1931, and she ended up being a a Church of God missionary, uh, just an incredible woman, one of the heroes of our whole movement. She was born 1931 in Anniston, Alabama, and she felt a call to missions work with the Arab people. And she got that feeling and that call when she was 15 to to go to the Arab world from, from Alabama. You know that's different, right? Arab world, Alabama. They both start with A, and that's about it. Very different. She graduated from Bible college in 1951, so she was about 20. She met with the Church of God World Missions Board for an appointment to the the Muslim country of Tunisia in northern Africa, but they declined to send her because she was young and she was single. Margaret was deeply disappointed. She returned home to Alabama, but then while seeking God, she felt compelled to go on her own anyways, outside of the denominational support. So in March, on March 25th, 1952, she boarded a plane to Tunisia and left home with $100 in her pocket by herself. She was later appointed as a Church of God missionary in 1956, four years later, 
They finally wised up to what was going on to assist this work in Tunisia. And then in 1964, she was sent to Jerusalem, where she began began many ministries, including establishing a church and school in the village of Abud. She served as the pastor of the Abud Church of God until 1992. It's 28 years. Being single the whole time, by the way. Until her fourth heart attack forced her to relocate back to her home in Alabama, where she became the pastor of a small congregation in Pell City, Alabama, at the Wattsville Church of God, this little congregation. While pastoring in Alabama, she continued to bless the Israeli people of Abud by uh, having building projects, fundraising, advisory leadership, and then that... That same call and that same tenacity that, that had kept her on the mission field all those years, that fueled her, past, <clears throat> excuse me, her pastoral work as she ministered each week and as she oversaw a, a remodeling project there. Then on Sunday, November 19th, 2017, Margaret Gaines went to sleep in her home city of Pell City, and she woke up in heaven with the Lord. So I want to show you a brief video of her. It's two minutes, and then we'll wrap up together. Whatever we're doing, it's a part of a whole. Because if you can imagine a purpose, and you can outline it, and you can set it for you, before yourself as a goal, it's too small for our God. His plan won't fit in our little brain. We can have some self-help stuff. We can do some things with with brawn and brain determination, but it's too small for God. If we want to have His plan, we don't ask. I wasn't the architect. I wasn't the contractor. In my life, I was a day worker. A day worker doesn't know what he's building. A day worker doesn't have to understand the the plan, doesn't have to know what, how his part fits in the plan. The only thing I ever did was to love God and obey him one day at a time. This is not our life. This is our opportunity to honor him. Let's waste this life for him. Give it up. Let him burn us up, burn us out, pour us out. Let us be trampled on, consume us, use us up, provided he's glorified. And then we can live life eternal in heaven with nothing. Just an amazing woman who I'm sure is enjoying her reward in heaven now. Just another example of being poured out, just saying, Lord, here I am. If you want to use me, I'm available. I'm ready because I've widened my view and I see it. I see. I see people. I see there's a bigger story here. So just as a reminder from last week, like we talked about, let's never forget that the real church isn't a place or a belief. It's a lifestyle. It's what we say, it's what we think, it's what we do as we go to work and as we go to school, as we go to restaurants and stores and other people's houses. It's anywhere and everywhere that we go, it's who we are. It's watching God move in everyday life as we obey him and follow his word and his spirit and his voice. It's seeking his vision and his plan for our lives and for our families. Not just on a a major epic scale, but on a small, simple, daily basis. It's widening our view to make space for outsiders in our lives and in our church. So let me close today with just a couple questions for you to reflect on. Just simply these. Who has the Lord placed in my life that I might not be seeing from his perspective? And then how can I widen my view to reach them? Who has the Lord placed in my life that I might not be seeing from his perspective? And then how can I widen my view to reach them? We're going to ask the Lord to help us with this. 
to take off any blinders we may have, to shake us out of our routine and our rut if we're, if we're struggling there, and to develop eyes to see things through His eyes. So next week, we're going to finish up our series by talking about three more areas that we need to grow wider in. But for today, let's stand together and let's close in prayer and ask the Lord to help us. The challenge is there. You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is hard. It is uncomfortable. It takes a lot of courage. But let's be the church that is known for courage. Let's be courageous people. Let's be great commission people. Let's reach far out. Let's see. Can we ask the Lord to help us? Heavenly Father, great Lord, creator of the universe, and our dad. We, we want to be people who, who are sharpened and people who see what's going on around us, to see the people around us, to fulfill your great commission. We don't want to just do church. We don't, we don't want to just be in the routine and in the fog of the, the culture that we live in. We want to be different. We want to make a difference. And so, Lord, we ask you to open our eyes to see what maybe we're not seeing. There's somebody in our life that we're just not seeing the way that you're seeing them. Show us, Lord. There's people around us just in our area that we're not, we've never even, it's never even been on our radar. Give us a burden, Lord. Give us a burden for new people. People that are desperate and maybe don't even know it. People that are hurting don't know about the life in Christ that you sustain us and you give us hope you have a plan they don't know about that Lord so just prepare us for a season of blessing and of fruit as you raise up a new generation of passionate Christ followers from the youngest to the oldest you're, you're calling those that are that are willing you're calling them calling us to a deeper and a wider level. So we give you thanks and praise. We are honored to be your people, to be your kids. We ask you to remove any distractions that are blocking us from being who you, you've created us to be. And set us on the path of truth and righteousness. And um, we just trust you, Lord trust you with it. We don't know what it's all going to turn into, but we trust you with it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, praise the Lord and thank